to speak on the of reciprocals of recurrence relations. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophia Davis. The title of our talk today is Sums of Reciprocals of Recurrence Relations. Um, before I begin, I would like to thank everyone that worked on this paper, and then, of course, a special shout out to Stephen J. Miller for all of his mentoring and advice throughout this entire process. Now, I would like to give you guys a general outline of what we'll be talking about today. So first we will begin by introducing generalizations and balancing and co-balancing numbers and their recurrence of describing them. Then we will transition into explaining new results of on reciprocal sums of sequences. And finally, we will wrap up and, and by introducing generalizations of square balancing and co-balancing numbers, as well as the patterns that they follow. Now, I will first begin by defining A, B balancing and co-balancing numbers. Um, in previous work, they have only been defined by uh, setting A and B equal to one. And today we will be defining them as A, B balancing numbers are integers N such that the equality here is satisfied for fixed positive integers A and B and some non-negative integers R, which is called the balancer N. For example, the first uh, one, one balancing numbers are listed here with their corresponding balancers. And for another example, we have the first two, three balancing numbers along with their corresponding balancers. Now, co balancing numbers are going to be similar except for the inclusion of n um, right here in the um, equality. And an example of that would be for the first one, one co balancing numbers along with their corresponding balancers. Co balancers listed on the screen, along with another example. Now, Bahar and Panda showed that 1 1 balancing numbers follow this recurrence relation, as well as for 1 1 co balancing numbers, they come up with this recurrence relation as well. Now, um, in the next couple slides, we are going to be discussing some tables that we generated using our AB balancing and co balancing numbers. And we will denote this as our notation for today. And for anything, uh, any constants that we add, those will be denoted with um, the underlining here, which you will see in the tables. Now, the AB balancing and co balancing numbers can be expressed by a variable length of recurrence. And they can be generally expressed using a depth by recurrence in the form 1k, negative k, negative 1, 1 which you'll see some interesting patterns at the end of our first table here. Now, balancing numbers and their corresponding balancers can uh, be defined by using this recurrence formula, and it is the same case for co-balancing co numbers and their co-balancers. Now, for um, coefficients of um, A, B being the same, we see that uh, for Co balancing and balancing numbers um, that they do show up the same here. And um, there's a pattern we see in the table where for all of the coefficients for the balancing numbers table, um, each coefficient is two less than the square of some number. Now, for given coefficients that do that are different, we do find a pattern still. Um, and if you would like to learn more about that, please feel free to reach out to anyone. Any of us after the talk. Now, looking at this second table here for co balancing numbers, we do have a special case with the coefficient 3, 1. Now, whenever we were doing the work, we found that there was no co balancing numbers for coefficients 3, 1. That's why it is denoted none here in the table. Now, in different coefficients that we tried, um, we found that we weren't able to get enough terms to build a recurrence relation for the sequence. Therefore, they have been left undetermined in various spots. This is all discussed further in our paper. Um, and so, um, moving forward, um, the 1B and 2B co balancing numbers and their co balancers can actually be more conveniently um, expressed using depth to recurrences. In fact, if we go back to table two and look at the first two rows, we can actually reduce this to a depth to recurrence um, with a constant AB co-balancing term, which you can see in this table here. Please note um, the underlying numbers are that constant term that we added, the AB co-balancing term. Um, 
Now, um, yes, so here's the depth to recurrence. And what we can actually do with this is um, all recurrences of this form are going to be in the form 2m plus 2 negative 1m, where m is equal to 2b over a. Now, <clears throat> expressing these as depth to recurrences is actually more helpful than expressing them how we did previously with a depth 5 recurrence, because we can actually locate the um, beginning point due to the coefficients thanks to the depth to recurrence. Now, we can actually do something similar with the corresponding cobalancers here, um, which is this fourth table we see here. However, as you can see in the comparing the two tables, this one does not have that constant AB um, cobalancer term at it. So the way that these recurrence would be um, denoted would be 2m plus 2, negative 1, where once again m is 2b over a. Um, unfortunately, uh, through our work, we found that we weren't able to do um, something similar with balancing numbers and their balancers. They are best expressed with the general um, uh, depth five recurrences that you guys saw earlier. So now moving forward, we're going to talk about three interesting theorems um, involving balancing, balancing numbers. Um, the first of which is that Q1 is unique in that it is the only choice of coefficients A and B, so that every integer n is a balancing number. Um, and so when we're actually doing this, we're generating balancing numbers with mathematical code, and when we encounter this, you can imagine our surprise we're testing up like 100,000 digits, and it just prints out all integers. So that did not work well for computer. Um, so to prove this, we start off with the definition of balancing numbers, and then we can simplify a little with uh, theorem for sums of consecutive integers, as shown here. We can then solve for r. Um, we know that r must be an integer, so we can set the uh, part under the square root equal to m, where r has to be an integer for all values of n, because that's going to give us all solutions for any m. Um, if we set m equal to xm plus 1, where x is any real number, we get this equation and we can then match corresponding terms of m to get these equations over here and then solve for x. When we solve for x, we can plug it back in to get the solutions for a and b. And since a and b have to both be greater than 0, q1 is our only solution for balancing numbers. Um, we proved a similar theorem for co-balancing numbers. Um, but in this case, we found that there are no solutions A and B, so that every integer n is a cobalancing number. The methods of this proof are very similar, but give no solutions, so I'm not going to go through the details. Um, we also proved a third theorem about uh, cobalancing numbers, where we found an interesting pattern when coefficients A and over time B equal to 1, um, such that there would only be one cobalancing number n. Interestingly, this theorem corresponds to three other cases that um, has to do with congruence classes from four. And in the other cases, we conjectured that there would be no covalent numbers. In those cases, we encountered very messy diagram equations. We weren't able to show that there aren't any solutions, um, but through the code, we weren't able to find any in any of those cases. That matches, that corresponds to the case that we were talking about earlier with tree one. For balancing for co-balancing numbers, how there are no solutions in that case. That's why I said none here. Um, so for the proof of this theorem, we again start with the definitions for co-balancing numbers and solve for R and substitute for the values of A and B at the end of the theorem statement. Um, we know R can't be equal to zero because that would require A is equal to zero, which can't happen. So we can consider only positive values of R, again sending it to some integer M. We can simplify the equation and write r in terms of n. And since we can do this, since we can let y be any positive integer, this accounts for all solutions of n. And since n is going to uniquely correspond to a value of r, this is going to give us a unique set of coefficients a and b that correspond with only one solution n in any of those cases. Um, so now moving on, we're going to introduce some new theorems about the simple sums of sequences. There's been a lot of previous work on this. Um, Sukhna Nakamura proved the following theorem about reciprocal sums of Fibonacci numbers. 
I'm saying reciprocal sums were really the, the floor function of the reciprocal, the infinite reciprocal sum of the recurrence starting at the end term of the sequence. A lot easier to just say reciprocal sums. That's what I mean when I say that. Um, and they proved that it's a very beautiful formula that it only just depends on f one minus two, and then slightly depending on whether n is even or odd, different by one. Um, so we followed very similar methods for this proof, and we tried to generalize it for depth to recurrences. Here we dealt with the first theorem involves depth to recurrences plus a constant term. Q and S are arbitrary real numbers. However, we had to set the second coefficient with negative one over here. Um, that was just necessary in the proof. Hopefully, we can try to generalize it to any depth of recurrences of this form. Um, and then we find a similar result. Interestingly, you'll note here that the result does not depend on the parity of n. Um, and also, we have cn minus cn minus one instead of just the fn minus two term. And that makes sense because that's just property of Fibonacci numbers when you simplify it to fn minus two in that case. Um, so now, go through the proof. <coughs> so, the follow similar formats of previous proofs. Um, so, the first step that you have to do is find a generalized formula for the square of the nth term of the sequence. Um, and then that's helpful later in the proof. Uh, interestingly, the q variable disappears here when we find this, um, this equation. And then if we can use induction to find the upper and lower bounds for the infinite reciprocal sum. Um, such that the denominator of the term is different by one. And then when we take the reciprocal again, the, we bounded the reciprocal of the infinite reciprocal sum between two consecutive integers, and then taking the floor function of that gives us our desired result. Um, our second theorem deals with similar recurrences, depth to recurrences, but here we have arbitrary coefficients Q and R that are real numbers. In this case, you'll see this is the generalization of the theorem with Fibonacci numbers um, that we again have it depending upon the parity of n. And if you just plug in the Fibonacci recurrence here, you get the exact same result because the Cn minus Cn minus one simplifies to Fn minus two. Um, proof of this is very similar, although the reason it depends on the parity of n is because when we get the result for the square of the nth term, we have this over here that depends on the parity of n. And that affects our result. And so when we prove it, we have to split into two different cases for even an odd n um, to obtain the result. Okay, now um, we go back to uh, trying to generalize further the concept of AB balancing and co balancing numbers, which led us to define um, first the AB square balancing numbers, which are the same as the AB balancing numbers, except notice that the terms here in the parentheses are squared. And similarly, we call R the square balancer of N. And here we have a figure that shows the frequency of square balancing numbers for varying coefficients A and B, where A is increasing downward and B is increasing rightward. Um, notice the white points on um, this figure represent the AB coefficients that are not co-prime. And we just set them to white because they don't provide us any new information. Um, and we want to make sure that we um, look at the real patterns and if we have like repeating information that might mess things up. So we just set them to white. Um, notice that we have a trivial solution when n equals one and r is equal to zero. So all of the great points um, are that uh, the coefficients a and b that have that one trivial solution. And the red points here are the coefficients a, b that have two solutions, including the trivial solution. And um, you might not notice, but there's a black point here and another one around here um, that corresponds to three, um, three solutions or three square balancing numbers. So we, are, we weren't able to find any coefficients A and B that have more than three square balancing numbers. Um, and Panda had conjectured that for A and B equal to one, so the uh, the original definition of uh, square balancing numbers where a b is equal to one, that they only have um, that they only have the trivial solution, and our code um, so is in agreement with that conjecture. And now we similarly define the a b square co-balancing numbers, where the only difference with the square balancing numbers is 
this extra that we include the n squared term here. Um, and similarly, we call R the square covalence of, of n. Now, in this figure, there isn't a trivial solution. So again, we um, mark as white all of the A B coefficients that are not co prime. And the black points here are the ones that have um, the coefficients A B that have one square covalency number. And we weren't able to find any coefficients A and B that have more than one um, square covalency number. And notice that there's a pattern that is arising. So here we have this pattern that is symmetric and uh, periodic that repeats after every 42nd um, A term and every sixth B term. And while we don't know um, the correlation between the A, B coefficients and the exact um, N and R or the exact square covalency number and its respective uh, square covalency, we do know that if A and B are in this path or like fit into this pattern, um, that the R, the square covalencer, has to divide A minus B, and N, the square covalency number, has to equal R or equal R minus 1. Um, and for future work, there's a lot that we could have included in this section, but the things that we are most interested in are first, um, we mentioned that the um, AB. Uh, that we can express these in terms of recurrence relations of uh, step five, but we would like to know if there's a generalized recurrence formula, given that we were unable to find a specific one for certain AB coefficients. Um, and the recurrences that we found were of the form 1k minus k minus 1 and 1, so we would like to see if there is a generalization of that. Um, and also, when Eliel was talking about the um, reciprocal sums, our proof was limited by a recurrence relation of this form, but where R had to be equal to negative one. So if we are able to find a generalized formula for A n squared for recurrence of this form where R is any real number, that would help us further generalize our results of those reciprocal sums. And finally, we would like to know when do the coefficients A and B not have any balancers or co-balancers? Um, we saw the examples for A equal to three and B equal to one, but um, that's not an exhaustive list. So we would like to know if there's um, a way to know exactly when they don't happen. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a lot more that we could have included in our future work section. So if you're interested, you can talk to us about it. And yeah, we'd like to acknowledge the University of Michigan and Williams College for assisting us um, in coming to this conference, as well as the conference organizers and the um, International Fibonacci Association for having us here. Um, and yeah, again, Professor Miller for all his help, and Ifan, who is in the back, um, who is also a mentor in this project. Thank you. Thank you. Directly for questions, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the other reciprocal sums. Um, and it seems like, um, uh, how do I say? Um, you get this difference between three consecutive terms. And I'm curious if you could get a single term there to kind of move the weirdness into the actual sum formula. So you could get something more similar to the Nachi case um, on the left hand uh, on the right hand side, but less similar on the left hand side. Um, if there's like a yeah, yeah. So, so you're saying to combine this with the one term, you have to leave more messy over here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something that looks more like what you have in the Fibonacci case on the right hand side, but the left hand side looks more complicated in a different way. I'm wondering if that's possible with the same. Um, so previous work has focused on other things other than CK as the denominator here. Yeah. Um, for this proof, we worked on it in this form and just, just generalized the same result. The only reason it, it looks nicer in the Fibonacci case. Is because we have yeah. f of n minus f of x. Yeah, simple x minus first uh, like move that simplification kind of into it. Into like, so I get this as t n minus two. Yeah, um, yeah, I get this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if that would. I'm not sure if that would follow any pattern because there's nothing actually. What this is showing is there's nothing really special about f n minus two. Okay. It's only that it's for the matrices. Uh, I'm not sure. We could probably use um, 
the recurrence above to simplify the right hand side here, but uh, this was like the simplest form that just could ever come. But, it, but it's, it's an interesting question. If I give you something nice on the right hand side, can you find something? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll use okay rather than nice. Yeah, that would definitely be another interesting thing to look at. We did the same. So, the grid drawing you had of the 80 bouncing numbers that had that, that vertical, that sort of like the diagonal line. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Um, you said it's on the A value is every 42, and then the B value is seven. Every six. Every six. Oh, it's just seven. I was wondering, do you know why that's happening? Or, and also, when you zoom in, it doesn't look really pure. It looks like there's outliers off that. Off oh. that too. Yeah, so. Um, so, yeah, so we have A decreasing down here, B going across. It's not exactly a line, but there's a pattern that we find that goes around 42 values if it's around to here. Um, but it's not going on the line, so some of them jut out. We have like interesting small patterns that repeat within that um, of like varying lengths, and so it's not always going in a line. We weren't able to show why this pattern is going up. Um, but it's an infinite pattern, doesn't it? Right yeah, so it repeats. Here's the first one, goes here for a second, the third one slightly cut off, goes over here. And there's interesting properties within the pattern as well. You talk about that in the paper at all, or is that just some kind of concept you look at tangentially? You speak about that in the paper at all, or is that a little bit more? Uh, we can talk about more after the talk as well. There's like interesting patterns for the values of the NFR for these bounding numbers in this. But we don't know what the relationship is between like why it repeats after every 40 second A term and six B term. Um, we don't know the exact correlation between the A and B coefficients and the um, Square co-balancers and their co um, and their co-balancing numbers, but we we do know that they that it's like symmetric and periodic. Um, not exactly sure. Any other questions? All right, let's thank you again.